سلام بچا خوش اومدی واکم تو دیس موندی استریم اوف لاس پلوماس د سیمور یو نو د دریل پلیز از سون از پاسیبل کانفرمیشن دت یو کان هیر می دت یو کان سی می اند ام آی ان فوکس یو نو دت ایز مای کانسپ کوشن بیکوز I am as blind as a bat, you know that, and it's a little bit tricky to me to see from this distance. Hello, babies! Uh, yeah, it's a little bit tricky to me to see if I am unfocused, which I think I am. Shalom, Aaron. Welcome to this stream. I miss you. Oh, hello, Claire. Everything seems fine. That is indeed fantastic. Everything looks good. All good in the hood. How are you, Butcha? How has your Monday started? Because let me tell you, thanks to a person, I've had a lovely Monday, a really lovely morning, and quite. quite productive if i need to be honest and that is not normally what happens <laughs> so yeah let me just you know fix some bips and bops over there and uh, yeah how's your monday been i want to know i want to know i want to know can you show me <laughs> i want to know about strangers like me oh don't we all love that film and don't we all love that song i don't know i know i love it How are you? How's how's the week going? How's everything coping with it, you know? The situation? I'm not going going to Before all right, yeah, there was something I wanted to say, but as you know, here up here nobody's driving, so I wanted to make a disclaimer to myself. And it's not a disclaimer, it's just some kind of a public apology for my stupid past self, which is the song that I listened to before streaming is Na- Magnum Bullet by Night Rider, and I keep on saying Night Runner. I say Night Runner. Like it. Hold on. Let me actually check on that. Because this is torturing me. Like I cannot get the name straight, and I don't know bloody why. Oops. Can say I can say bloody right. Oof. One days in the world of teaching a secondary school. You know. My my thoughts and my strength goes to you. My. My, my my part here Aaron knows yeah I know exactly what you're talking about right so I'm I'm checking the song the name of the song is Magnet Bullet by Night Runner and I call it R- Night Rider every bloody time at why why I do not know it's just I cannot get this straight for some reason and it's painful because then guys if you look up if you look the song up you're going to get it wrong And it's just and it's all my fault because again once again nobody is driving here it's just it's, yeah it's a roller coaster ride of emotions any any <laughs> so Monday in the world of teaching i know i know the spirit got to you actually right now we are on independent learning week and uh, yeah that is the doesn't mean we have a week off at least teachers we don't have a week off we have a a week to catch up <laughs> with a lot of things <laughs> i'm very grateful for that and um is everything okay guys because with the light and stuff also what you think of this light can you see me properly because i mul is already on that is because outside it looks for all the people it looks grim but for me it looks amazing because it's gray and it's dark and cloudy and it's been drizzling the whole day which is not something i'm annoyed of i really like raining But yeah, it's just I put mole in another uh, in in another position because it was like having it in front of me. Uh, like it was, you know, I looked like a deer in the headlight, like, and that that is not good. You shouldn't be that tough to yourself. I think it looks good, greyish, which is fine. You mean the weather? You mean me? <laughs> What is it? What is it that looks greyish? I like it though. I like the weather here. So. What are we drinking today? Today we are drinking happiness. And why is that? Because if you know something about plumas is that plumas loves lemons. Lemons are the joy of life. Shout out to all my past and friends that come from Murcia. <laughs> the land of the lemons. And today we are drinking over here my hand with me. We are drinking Fun enough, we're drinking a mix, it's not tea, it's a, an infusion, it's a mix of, of herbs. And it's called Lemonade, like Beyonce's album. Mm-mm-mm-mm. But, but, does it have any lemon in it? <laughs> Isn't that funny though? Because it has apple pieces, rose hip, 
lemongrass, orange peel, calendula petals, and no bloody lemon. So why is it called lemonade? Ah, I don't know. But still tastes like happiness. I love lemon so much. I'm a big fan of this mixture. Mm. Yeah. Claire is smiling. All right, so welcome, Butcher, to this Monday stream of Las Plumas, the Simur. My name is Plumas, and I'm going to be your host in this Mesopotamian mythological ride. Today, we're going to cover one of my favorite topics ever, which is mythology. But because it's been a while since the first time that we made the last edition of this, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a minute to recap on some things. What is that, Aaron? So no lemon. Ask them for your money back. Right? <laughs> I know my rights as a consumer. Can you hear that? It's like, Goku, where are you, my pal? <laughs> Monday. Woo! So, I was saying, I was saying, yeah. Because it's been a while since the last time we covered mythology on this channel, I'm going to take a few moments to recap on important things. The first one is that we are going to be, we're going to do here is that we're going to talk about 15 different deities from the Mesopotamian pantheon. Now, talking about anything Mesopotamian until the, ta um, the tag of the label of Mesopotamian is itself, in itself, a mistake because there was not such thing as a Mesopotamian anything. There is no consensus. And when we're talking about Mesopotamian history and art and mythology, we're covering a period of thousands of years. And things do change quite a lot in the past of those, like, those years. So, for the sake of public sharing and for the sake of easterness, I am simplifying things down, but I didn't want to start without this disclaimer to myself. First, we're going to cover an entirety, like the entirety of the, of the, of the data we're going to cover from, com, sorry, come from different panthers. I have, by the way, bear with me, Bichar, because I have the feeling that today, even if I was working in English for the whole day, I feel like I could not English today for some reason just like it's, it's like my brain's had enough and it's like pfft, switching off like just, i'm not i'm not englishing today but indeed you are my friend if you're here you can hear me so um what was i oh yeah yeah uh the deities we're gonna meet today come from a variety of pantheons throughout the time and space we have the sumerian pantheon we have the babylonian pantheon hello typhoon we have um sumerian babylonian akkadian pantheon assyrian pantheon at some point and some of these deities they were common and shared between different cities and different uh, cultures or societies but some of them were not and i'm gonna give as much as close as is possible but this the intent behind this stream is you to get acquaintance with a religion that you know we know one or two because we know inanna we know shamash uh we know nana which by the way the moon oh sorry goggle pal the moon is back because yes in this house we are of team nana nana the moon god is my favorite and the best god in the pantheon and that is not a suggestion that is not a hypothesis that is actual fact factual information mm -hmm. so uh i just wanted to get you familiar with all the deities that are as cool as the ones we normally know but not so we're not so familiarized with them and that is going to change today um, if you want to know about the deities that you probably have heard of before, I suggest you, me a common butcher, uh, I suggest that you um, pop by and just get a browse on the channel and see the first part of this Mesopotamian building pantheon, which I think you will enjoy. I cannot, I just forgot, I just forgot, because again, no one's driving and it's Monday, it is Monday for the love of Satan. So. Thank you so much to everybody who's followed and subscribed to the channel. With your subscriptions and uh, your follows, you help me greatly. Also, thank you to my patrons, especially to those of Tiad Murshid and Ashdod. If you want to get a glimpse of behind the scenes content, extra content that does not uh, release on social media, if you want to vote what content's coming uh, ahead, I invite you to head over to my Patreon, Patreon slash Las Plumas Vesimur, and 
I don't know, consider supporting the channel and you'll have a good one. My pattern family is amazing. They're lovely, they're sweet and we have a great time over there. So yeah, consider donating to your local streamer today. <laughs> mm. So uh, yeah, also a thing to know about Mesopotamian deities is that there's not such thing as one attribute per one deity. What I mean is that, of course, there are some general ones. For example, Utu is uh, Utu or Shamash is the only goat uh, god of the. I was going to say goat <laughs> is the only deity, as in god of the sun. Nanna, uh, Inanna, Shamash, like they are. These are pretty much uh, established. However, there's multiple gods and goddesses of fire. There's multiple god of goddesses of crops, and uh, yeah. God had multiple attributes and multiple things they are worshipped for and also they share those attributes between themselves. For example, today we're going to meet a fire deity, but, but it's not the only fire deity that was in the Mesopotamian pantheon. And what is that? Because gods and Mesopotamian cities were local and that means each city has a particular patron of the or of I'm joking. Uh, each uh, city had a particular patron they worshipped and that took care of the city. Of course, in that city could be the temples of higher deities. For example, Inanna, like the three luminaries, Inanna, Inanna, and Shamash, for example. Um, and uh, more than one deity could uh, inhabit a, a temple or a city. But, you know, each city with uh, the temples, that what I mean. I don't know how it, I'm, I'm actually unroll this and my tongue if possible. What I mean is that every single city didn't have one exclusive deity. They could have two or three even and they would have separate uh, temples, of course separate places of worship because there were different deities, but, but there's no problem with more than one god inhabiting one temple in one city. It's a, it's, that is no problem at all. Also, something very interesting to know about iconography because chances are that if you google any of the gods or goddesses that we're going to see today you will encounter familiar familiar images right the problem art historians face is that unless the deity is a explicitly identified by a text accompanying image b has particular attributes we connect and link to all the deities we don't know who do we have in an image. It's very tempting to um, identify gods and goddesses just like that. It's like, that is not how it works. That is not how our history works. And that will happen when you will see, for example, if you type Ninurta, or we're going to talk about Ninurta today, let me tell you, we're going to talk about Ninurta. <laughs> um, if you type any of the names that I am going to mention, the chances are we're going to, you're going to see one or two images that are going to repeat over and over and over. But the truth is, for most of these gods and goddesses, we do not have an established iconography. And that is because it could be for, because of a variety of reasons. The first of all being nothing has been preserved because time has passed and that from war to abandonment to changes in worship, we do not preserve the original temple for the original images or the original statues. Then we have unidentified deities, which we have an image of. We don't know who they are because we cannot venture, we cannot just throw, we can have hypotheses, but we cannot establish like for a fact that these goddess that looks a little bit like Inanna is in fact Inanna because a lot of these pieces often are not contextualized and that means they just found, just appear and that is tricky. So yeah, I brought images, of course I did because you know I'm a Nazi historian and I love showing you images and these ones are gorgeous. But bear in mind that not every single deity I'm going to work with will have a particular image attached to it. So it's all right about that. Um, I, I trust, however, nevertheless, I trust in the powerful power of your imagination. So close your eyes and yeah, you just can picture the deity on your head. Right. And I think that is everything I had to say before. Um, Am I forgetting something or anything or something like a particular question? You know, remember like over here in the lovely chat that you can ask as many questions as you want. I will do my best to answer them. And this is a shout out to my lovely, fantastic moderators out there. 
remember then you can comment and you can express your opinions but keep it fresh and keep it you know polite don't be rude don't be rude to me don't be rude to anybody in in the chat we are here this is a safe space this is a safe environment and we will keep it that way is that clear so i'm gonna take a sip a sip of my tea and we're gonna continue where we left oh the first one though mm. Oh, I love this one, but it doesn't have any lemons. I should have put like, you know, like a, just a slice of lemon in it and that would be the completion of it. Right, for all my long, like long time butcher, I want to ask you, do you guys recognize these peep? Do you guys recognize this lad? Hello, Danny. Hello, Lemon Lover, for you and Look at Warship, did they have some kind of organized priesthood? Indeed, they did. Uh, I had an article on that, but possibly we're going to do a stream on that, um, on that particular topic. So yeah, they did have a very, very thorough organized priesthood. So, Elena's here! Of course, so who knows who this peep is? Who can tell me who this lovely fella is? And I said lovely because like, I love them dearly. Who is this? Elena knows, of course Elena knows. <laughs> She's an archaeologist for crying out loud. Mm. Now that you're here, but chat, let me tell you, I'm just gonna wait, 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 wait. We'll come back to this. Let me just spam because I'm so blessed with the community of butcher that we have. Um Elena, my my pa Elena over here, my butcher Elena, she did, she created the most amazing. 3D reconstruction of the city of Elefantina, I hope I pronounced that properly, ever behold. It's it's just amazing. It's just I I it blew my mind entirely. So I just want to do this shout out because I am here to just shower love onto you guys. And she did an amazing job. And for that she should be praised. So good job, Elena. I really liked it, although I didn't understand that quite well. I didn't I didn't get the full inside of it because that is not my period but i just want to say that i'm super proud of my butcher like my, my butcher are amazing they are amazing so <laughs> all right let's go back to mesopotamian pantheon thanks i'm not embarrassed don't be embarrassed you did a fantastic job elena that should be known you deserve more publicity than the one you reckon it was beautiful add on my lovely secretary can you i saw this 3d model it was really awesome right right <laughs> <laughs> my dyslexia attacks again yeah here yeah. right yeah of course it was Danny Yoon of course it was so all right who's this peep just gonna take a sip of my tea if no one says I'm gonna say you know that right <laughs> Just gonna give you time to it. Um, all right, so this, this is, drum, we cannot insert drum rolls. One day I'll know how to. This is Pazuzu. This is lovely, jackously, ass holly Pazuzu. He is uh, the one from, <laughs> to see Helen, I put in the P up. Um, El adorno de Navidad. Hey, I didn't know. I don't know who that is, but I'm sure I'll see it in my nightmares from now on. Exactly. Of course you will. This is Pazuzu. He is the king of the Lilu, which are the demons of the wind. And and one of my favorite creators in the entire Mesopotamian pantheon. I am excited, Bachat. So um, this demon, this deity had an extremely marked personality and depending on the version of the text that we find uh, it says that he actually was the brother of Humbaba which is the dear dear guardian of the cedar woods screw you Gilgamesh like so heavily screw you and uh, Pazuzu is linked to the scorching wind you know that burning wind that can rip your skin out and um, it's also connected to the south and this scorching wind was thought to bring famine and destruction 
and and on top of everything Pazuzu was connected to locust that brought terrible consequences for harvest because they devour the harvest locusts are very like you know they're, they're, they're not something that they were they were back in the day locusts were a plague that caused many many um like breakdowns in economy and in the nutrition of the people because they were dangerous and it's really interesting how how pazuzu had these I've always, when I talk about Bazuzu, which I do often, by the way, I always emphasize how his iconography was put a lot of thought into, in the sense that he was conceived to be easily recognizable. If you see Bazuzu, there's like a million statuettes of, uh, statuettes, sorry, of Bazuzu here and there in a lot of different museums, and he has four wings. His body is that of a, his torso is that of a person, but his quarters, the skin quarters, are those of a lion. He has a tail and he has this characteristic beard, the face of a lion. This is, you know, the mixture between this lion esque and then human features. Um, he has claws and he has, actually, his penis is in the shape of a snake, head and everything included. This bastard is so easily recognizable. And here we have something very interesting, and that is Bazuzu was actually summoned when they needed, when human needed, to repel all the demons because that was his might. He was so powerful that was the only one able to expel all the demons, and it was used for exorcisms and all the. Um, uh, cleansing rituals from uh, the, the spirit on the body and when he is summoned you have to be very very careful because if for any chance this by any chance he has or he's having a bad day he could just snap your neck and rip your head off because he has a very hot short temper do you guys remember i don't know if you've seen the first part but do you guys remember it rings a bell that i tell you often that mesopotamian deities have a very short temper that is one of the things i mean like uh and it appears in the exorcist film too exactly if you think these jackets is familiar it's because you probably have seen it in the film the exorcist I think there's a reconstruction at the very beginning of the, the Pazuzu is supposed to be the demon that possesses the girl, which is absolutely hilarious if you ask me. But yeah, <laughs> here, you, here you have it. So one of the one of the demons Pazuzu uh, served to repel the most was Lamashtu. And we covered Lamashtu in the previous stream, so I really recommend you to go check her out because she was terrifying. But yeah, if you had a Pazuzu on your side, you could possibly escape the terrible consequences of Pazuzu and the thing is something really fun about Pazuzu is that he's actually a shorty he's very very tiny he's very small like he's he's not as big as you would expect because let me tell you do not let do not let the size fool you he was powerful IF he was very powerful and um uh yeah uh, he could just up here and spread chaos everywhere literally everywhere there is there is no such thing as putting some reins over pazuzu and these head that i'm showing here these kind of head do you see that there has like um it's like a hole on top this is actually a talisman and these were extremely popular especially from a new babylonian period um uh, because these because it was used as a demon repeller, as a demon expeller, people would just hang these kind of tiny heads from on the necklaces as an amulet, as a charm to prevent demons from hurting them. And I think that is bloody fantastic. So yeah, there's a lot of these tiny heads in a lot of, of museums, a myriad of them are. I've seen some in the Louvre, I've seen some in the Pergamon Museum, I've also seen some in the British Museum. So yeah, pos most probably you've seen this one, but you didn't know who he was until now. See, he hello Kiwi, I didn't know you were here. Oh yeah, I like Bazuzu a lot. And the comic one, hello everybody, hello David, good to see you. Um, now, that was about Pazuzu, that was our deity number 16. Number 17 is another big favorite of mine, and I don't have image because 
this deity, this dark deity, didn't have a body. We're talking about Asaku. Asaku is a dark deity, one of the major, major demons in Mesopotamian thought. Its presence made the fish in the rivers die and the water from the rivers boil. It had an army of sons that were something like demon rocks, like deities, like demons sprouted from rocks because, because Asaku had a go one crazy night. He had a go with the mountain and that happened later. They had a could not spring. Oh, what is that? Kaufman, thank you so much for the follow. Muchas gracias. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, and um, also Asaku is also linked to the scorching wind, this this fire wind. Hello, Moraith! Oh, I was missing you. I was wondering where you were. <laughs> and um, more especially, more especially, Asaku is a demon that's linked with sickness. Epilepsy, fever, pestilence, headaches, vomit, blurry vision, and apoplegy. This is, like, Asaku is the representation of bad, of evil itself, of everything that cannot be escaped. Because if you pay attention to all the uh, sicknesses I listed, they are deadly, and it was very rare that anybody recovered from those. Very rare. Because, yeah, we're talking about a thousand odd years ago. That was, that was tricky. So you need to conceive Asaku in the most inconceivable way. And that, I know that's difficult, but just, he was deemed so terrible that he did not have a body. No eyes, no mouth, no limbs, nothing. According to some texts, it was because the human mind was not able to comprehend the extent of the horror that Asaku actually was. It's anything at all. I just love this kind of thing so much. I think that's so interesting because in Mesopotamia, a lot of demons and a lot of gods and goddesses are linked to sickness. And this is because uh, magic and, oh, sorry, oh, cool. uh, that is because magic and uh, health have been intertwined since the beginning of time, since the very dawn of time. Uh, magic and sorcery and the supernatural, they're a bit linked to the the world of medicine and health because there's been so many things at that time nobody could actually explain therefore the tone to the supernatural asako is one of the examples same as pasuthu but you know um yeah in in that time it was a little bit complicated to get rid of certain um maladies all right, now we're going to talk number 18 is Gira, Gira, which is one of the fire deities. And he's a god of fire, of light and of blacksmith, which is fantastic if you ask me. He is the patron of metalwork and metallurgy, and he's also patron of blacksmiths themselves. So he protected uh, these people who worked with metal. This is, I mean, this is one of the cases where we do not have an image of Gira, so this is the best I could do. This is lovely fire. <laughs> so yeah, Gira is one of those short-tempered gods, but traditionally he's he's deemed a little bit more positive. Yeah, he's like he's okay. Um, he was. Um, a more daily life god, so to speak. This god was actually in contact with humans almost constantly because, apart from blacksmith, which was a very important activity in Mesopotamia, um, he had a very close relationship with uh, buildings and the building of, of said buildings and manual works, and also with rituals of cleaning and cleansing and purification. And what is that? Well, that is because um, the adobe houses were made with um, with mud and fire is very important to cook, actually, to cook that mud and to make bricks. Therefore, Gira was a very, very important deity because of those bricks, you could actually, you could bake or cook bricks, but you could also break tablets and tablets were the main source to write. We talked in the first uh, bit, I'm going to just repeat this over because I think it's important. 
The first time we talked about Mesopotamian deities, we explained how important writing and the, the act of writing was for these people. Therefore, there's many deities that are protectors and patrons of writing, of the act of writing. Gira is not a patron of writing, but he's a patron of the action that leads to having sources. That means the cooking, the baking of the clay tablet to make it harden and make it you know, a sauce. And also about building houses, which was important. <laughs> People like to have a place to dwell, a place to, to rest that is not the wilderness on the outside. So yeah, Gira is deemed as a very important, positive, very positive um, daily life um, deity. And why, why do I say that they had, he had contact with humans? That is because sometimes Gods and goddesses could dwell in the supernatural realm, for example, above in uh, An or Anu, which is a sky, or underneath, underneath the earth in the underworld. But gods and goddesses could also be present in cities and could be present in societies, in, you know, in, in, um, in societies. Yeah, I think that's the word I was looking for, actually, societies. So, yeah, they could be present there and... Uh, Gira was one of them because, again, his job was to protect the blacksmith and the people who cooked and baked tablets. So, very important, very important deity indeed. Um, also, alright, something that I haven't emphasized yet, but I'm going to do it right now, is the dual character of a lot of deities. Almost every single deity has this dual personality in the sense that if they're having a good day, cool beans all good in the hood they're gonna be nice they're gonna be lit they're gonna be on point however however should you dare to annoy them or should you dare to call them whenever you're having sorry whenever they having a very bad day a very bad day you will be punished no excuses no reasons it's just they're having a bad day because mesopotamian deities are moody hot-headed and moody so if they're having an awful day, they're going to pass it on to you because they feel better when others suffer. And that goes to Gira as well. He is bloody fire. So if he's not having the time of his life, he could just burst you into tiny ashes if he wanted to. Lovely people to meet. That is the reason I like Nana. Nana is not, Nana is not uh, like a fear, like a, a fierce hot temper deity. He's just like chill. He's just there minding his own businesses, going around with his cow. I love Nana. Pink Nana. You have it. Oh, where's my moon? Where's my moon moon? That one's not my moon. That one. Team Nana forever. Team Nana forever. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, talking about hot-tempered people. Let me look for the image. There we have him. So, yeah. I couldn't have brought this dual character up soon enough. This next deity is, it has actually two names. Sometimes Mesopotamian deities have two names. That is because we preserve the Sumerian name and the Akkadian name. And sometimes they even have like a third name or Babylonian name. That's the one we preserved. In this case, we have Adad or Hadad or Ishkur. I'm gonna call him Ishkur because I think that is powerful and metal. And this, this sir, uh, this gentleman over here is the deity of thunderstorm and thunder itself. Cool and metal, he is the heavy metal god in this pantheon and I really like heavy metal, so. Yes, uh, by the way, this is our picture this is a, a picture of a relief made by uh, August Layard which was a friend explorer and art historian and historian of if I'm not mistaken 19th century 18th century but Chuck, could you do me a favor and could you google August Layard to tell me exactly the dates uh, he lived because I am I'm, I'm awful with dates my, my brain does not retain dates whatsoever so if you could give me a hand i don't my honey my secretary <laughs> my secretary and by the way for those new here i said that out of a lot of respect and a lot of love because i don't is one of my old time but so yeah 
But let's go back to Ishkut. As you guys Google it and as you guys let me know when the dates of life and, and death of August Laya were, let's talk about heavy metal god. Let's talk about Ishkut. He was a god that, well, it was a storm god, a thunderstorm god, that controlled the water and the rain. Therefore, therefore, he was considered a benefactor and a protector of harvest because it's very, very important to eat. However, he could also be deemed as a potential threat because, again, if he was going too much in for that, he could provoke a drought, uh, sorry, uh, a flood, not a drought, so it's the opposite. So it could uh, provoke terrible floods and it's not just the heat that ruins the harvest. An excess of water definitely will ruin your crops and that means no food to you this year. So he was equally venerated and feared. Adad or Ishkur is a very feared deity. One of these deities you actually want to have content and at peace, just in case. Just in case. So you just, you don't want to you don't want to take chances with it. So um, because he had these massive destructive powers, he became a god of war and a patron of the soldiers, the protector of soldiers. And alongside Shamash, which we saw in the last um, the last stream of this collection, he had divination powers and also he was associated with justice and sometimes he was also summoned or invoked to be a witness in uh, trials or yeah in in um, uh, judgments when a when when a statement was going to be emitted or uh, yeah when a sentence was going to be emitted he was called and uh, this is very cool okay the houses the temples of Ishkur were everywhere and actually they were known as the House of Thunders, which I think personally, personally, that is bloody amazing that you have a House of Thunder. You guys let me know. And normally this is a very common iconography for Ishkur, which fortunately we have a lot of examples of. Who, excuse me. So he will be represented with his hands in attacking position that here holding a weapon on one hand because remember he's a patron of war and uh war making and the other thing the thing that's grasping sorry the thing that's grasping he and his close fist are thunders and possibly possibly he was gonna throw them like i think it was zeus Zeus is a, is a thunder god in the greek pan yes he's a thunder god in the greco roman pantheon Zeus, Jupiter, and he was also represented as about to throw one of his thunders, you know, to potential enemy because to Ishkur, everyone's a potential enemy. So, um, yes, um, and this in this, uh, okay, let's gonna, um, let's gonna dive into the art history vocabulary. These kind of representation, these gods or goddesses that are about to strike are known in, in art history under a particular term, and that is smitting god because, well, they are about to smit. Ta-da! Now you know something. Possibly you didn't know that, but I wanted, I really want to think that I teach you at least one or two things with these streams. One or two, not once. And um, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, talking about symbols, sometimes Ishkur uh, can appear with the lion snake, the lion serpent, or the lion dragon, which is a composite creature, that goes with him, one of his partners, but sometimes we can see Ishkur or identify Ishkur with uh, the bull, the bull of heavens, which is, you know, uh, bulls were revered, highly revered in Mesopotamian mythology, and um, it was a heavenly creature, so you could you can't see Ishkur with the with the heavenly the bull of heavens. But chat, you entirely ignored me. I kindly ask you for googling the date of life and death in August Layard, and <laughs> no one bloody did. <laughs> So thank you for that. Uh, could you, could someone actually do that? I'm curious. I just want to know at this point. I'm already running out of tea. The Celtic Corbett goddesses is also the goddess of both storms and war, right? Uh, is there any connection with Indra? Possibly. I mean, sorry, about the Celtic goddess, is that Morrigan? 
I don't know. I'm not an expert in Celtic mythology. I'm really sorry, Kiwi. Um, um, sandwich. Sandwich. Oh, is that a pun intended? Because I love it. <laughs> so, is there any connection with Indra? Possibly. Because we are aware, if you came to my stream about Zoroastrian, uh, Zoroastrianism, we talked about how these Indo-European um, tribes, so to call it, yeah, this Indo-European society moved to the Iranian plateau and all the others moved to Punjab, where the Bedic pantheon was developed. And I don't know if exactly with Indra himself, but definitely there must be something... Um, there must be something connecting both deities, and not just both deities, possibly connecting thunder gods throughout at least the Mesopotamian plateau and the Indus River Valley, because we know for, for a fact, we know for a fact, because we have evidence of that, that there was a very active trade between the Mesopotamian Valley and the river in the Indus River, um, the Indo River Valley. So possibly with trade, objects are not the only things that travel. Ideas, concepts, beliefs, deities. So it's, yeah, I, I really, I don't have like the source to cite right now. Um, sandwich, sandwich. Ooh, that's like a twist on that. Tongue twist for me. But yeah, I am, my opinion, my personal opinion is that definitely, definitely Ishkur is connected to Indra somehow. Yeah, absolutely everything. So he was like a greedy rock star that the tour manager had to satisfy for him not to blow everything up. That is the most accurate description of a lot of Mesopotamian deities I've ever read. Not only Ishkur though, not only Ishkur. All the Mesopotamian deities are super buddy. But there are theories uh, connecting Indo-European gods together. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That is, I do believe there's connections with not just Indo-European deities, but also Mesopotamian and um, Semitic gods and goddesses. Because we have, on the one hand, we have the Indo-Iranian, Indo-European uh, culture, but also Semitic cultures need to be taken under account. And yeah, but definitely, I agree with you. There must be some kind of connection for sure. Like, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm willing to believe that, definitely. Mm -hmm. So our next goddess is Ninlil. Ninlil is the spouse of Enlil and she's the mother goddess. She is the sovereign of the skies and as a mum, she has a, a lot of connections with medicine and healing arts. And also, as a companion of Enlil, she had some powers attributed, she was attributed some powers linked to the breeze and the wind. Because Enlil, if you remember for last time, or if you know Enlil already, he is a wind deity. Uh, of course, as a mother goddess, she has her attributes as a life-giving deity, a protector deity, and a head of a pantheon deity. Because she is a companion of Enlil. Enlil is supposed to be one of the fathers, um, but also she, um, uh, yeah, she's she has these uh, status. He, she shares, sorry, she shares her status with Enlil as both head of a pantheon. However, remember that if Enlil is a father, An, <laughs> An or Anu was supposed to be like the great father, the big, the sky was to be the great father, and. Um, Ninlil is the mom of Nanna. Ninlil is the mom of the moon god and supposedly, depending on the source, she uh, this is the first child she has. However, he gave birth to a lot more. Let me do something. I don't know if... I don't think Danny is still here, but... So one thing that Herodotus did was comparing Ninlil to Aphrodite. Hell no. Hell of a no. Hell to the no, Aphrodite and Ninlil are entirely separated deities, and Aphrodite was never a mum, neither head of a pantheon. You know, sometimes for the sake of making this cross connection quarters, we see links where they do not exist, and that is okay. Things cannot, cannot have a connection, if you know what I'm saying. Ninlil and Aphrodite are no, by any means, they're not connected. They're not the same deity and they, they never were. Herodotus, stop! <laughs> Greece, stop! Trying to make things the way you want them to look. Stop it! Stop it! Yeah. 
I'm just gonna take advantage that none of my Greek oriented bacha are here to say like no <laughs> hell no hell to the no mm -mm, mm -mm. no no all right we go to the city of Babylon right now we're gonna talk about if you know anything about uh, architecture in Babylon you will know the gate of uh, Ishtar so this is actually uh, a map of uh, Babylon and uh, we're gonna talk about a deity that also had a gate in Babylon but it's not that known we're gonna talk about Zababa Zababa was the patron of the city of Kish and also one of the many lovers in Annahad he is a warrior god a short temper warrior god and he is a pattern of courage of bravery and of the master of the expertise in the arts of the war he was known as the crusher of stones and i think that is one of the most metal given names that one could could you could you imagine actually being known to be like oh he comes plumas the crusher of stones i, I where do i sign I, where do I sign? I'll be delighted. Delighted, let me tell you. And um, the attributes of Zababa are lions or the the weapons that have the, um, the head of these animals, like maces. I've said this a myriad of times, but it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I am willing to repeat that. The mace is a weapon that was extremely popular in ancient history and normally these maces would have um, the shape of different animals in them. Oxen or lions were the most popular. So yeah, that is one of the weapons that Baba used. And um, sometimes because he's supposed to be part of the expertise in the arts of the war, uh, Zababa is shown with, um, with a bow. Just do not remember, he just can't use whatever hell of a weapon he likes because he's a master of the art of the war yeah like interesting enough oh he comes out on with side information i love it zababa means cool in hebrew so i'm expecting he is a cool god definitely he was definitely um yeah so something cool to know if you see do you guys see in the map around here if you follow my finger up do you see number three number three is the gate of zababa and zababa uh, the gate of Zababa had an inscription that said, "It hates its attacker." What? What a statement! What a statement! It was one of the ways they had to portray the courageous temper of Zababa as a war deity. Impressive, isn't it? I really like it. Um, I've seen that. I've eaten up a lot of the time so we need to speed up a little bit okay so now we have a pair of deities and i'm putting that together because they belong together in number 22 and 23 we have lugalira and we have meslamtia <clears throat> or meslamtea i don't know how to pronounce that properly actually these are two deities of the underworld known as the divine twins they were linked with death and its realm and in later cults they were treated as a guardian they were all treated as guardians of the gates of the underworld they were very closely friends with nergal with you know for obvious reasons because nergal is the plague god and one of the rulers of the underworld and stuff like that and um like with Pthuthu, there were a lot of statuettes and tiny figurines of Lugalira and Meslemtea, which, let me tell you, they were nuts. These two were hyper. They were, like, high on caffeine and all the things I'm not allowed to mention because of, <laughs> because of censorship. But you get an idea, you get a grasp of what I'm saying. They were just hyper twins. Apparently, that temper was... The behaviour, the mood were, like hype and hyper all the time and they were very they were very much crazy they were crazy deities and these figurines that i was talking about they will be put in the threshold they were buried in the threshold of doors so they will act as guardians and they will prevent bad spirits to come in and also for them not to direct the maniac crazy powers towards human and um because according to some sources the favorite hobby 
the theory activity of these two maniacs were uh, like tearing up opening human chests and ripping off the heart and also with the fist to clench the fist in uh, in the kidneys and they lovely and they lovely though okay so uh, again another <laughs> now we have another couple we have 20 24 and 25 are actually ancient uh, very ancient very old deities which are Anshar and Kishar. Anshar refers to the whole sky like the entirety of the sky and Kishar means the whole earth. These are primal deities which it means they have a law of age they were very very old age deities and they are the fathers of the father himself An, which is you know the big daddy. <laughs> Do not when I say Big Daddy, I am thinking about Bioshock. Sue me because I use that word. But yeah, the big father of the Mesopotamian pantheon is An. And the big daddy in Bioshock is a two, three meter tall monster in this diving suit with a drill in one of his hands. Very cool. <laughs> I love Bioshock. <laughs> So uh, yeah, uh, talking about Anshar and Kishar, apparently they were, even though they were told to be aged and very ancient, they were a posterior, they were a later creation to give Marduk, the Babylonian god, a greater popularity to get him, he was gaining a lot of popularity, so they were thinking of giving him um, like a more ancient genealogy. You know what? They, do you know what I mean? To just kind of legitimize Marduk as the new head of a pantheon in the, in the place of... He was taken in Lin's place, so they had to recreate and reconstruct this entire lineage for him. Because, yeah, lineage was very important in Mesopotamia. So, yeah. That is one of the... That is uh, two of the deities. And of this one, I actually have a fan art. This is Gestinanna. Uh, I love this picture so much. Um, the artist is now Kohoma in in. Uh, let me just double check the name of it. I am pretty sure I said it correctly. Yes, the artist is a uh, now Kohoma in Deviant Art. Go show some love to the old credit to the artist. This piece is magnificent, and the goddess this piece is representing is Hestinanna, which is a sister of Dumuzi and patron, a female patron of writing and the underworld. Because why not? <laughs> the mashup. This is a very. This was supposed to be a very old, uh, like a very older woman, and she was. Um, oh yeah, she protected the seers. And she protected also the fortune tellers, which is something I love, uh, and the dream interpreters. And yeah, she is normally addressed uh, as uh, an old lady, but look, she looks sharp. She looks sharp. She looks fantastic. And she's even, you know, showing one of those like the very popular Sumerian head styles. I love this picture so much, so, so much. And uh, she was also linked to music and to writing, which we are not sure. She's very cool, right, Viridi? She's lovely. So yeah, she was linked with writing and with music. And we do not know if that was a way of suggesting that she was a patron of the act of composing music. We actually don't know because we don't have a uh, very, like, yeah. and. Hestinana actually has a very... Do you see the grapevines on her head? That is because her name actually means ancient vine, like vine plant, and she has a powerful, strong connection with wine. Uh, yeah, one of her attributes is to be called the wine of the heaven. So here you have her. She looks fantastic. Again, one more time, all credits to the artist, now Kohoma in Deviant Art. You know, I, I cannot put names here, so yeah. Go check her out and show her some love and some credit because it's fantastic, fantastic piece. I really like it. I love when I can use actual fun art, like art created right now in our time of ancient deities and I can show them to you because I love sharing the work of all the artists. Thank you. So oh, thank you. 
he goes to secretary that Aaron, could you look up for me the life and dead days of August Layard? Please? <laughs> Por favor? Oh, I've been ignored. Oh. Guys, Bacha, my lovely Bacha, do you like puppies? Are you a fan of dogs? Because I am a very much a dog person. I love all animals, all animals in existence I love, but dogs, I mean, if you've been here long enough, you know I have a dog myself, her name is Sombra, and yeah, my family dog, and now we're gonna talk, uh, I'll tell you I tried, but I have no idea how to write it. All right, the name, there's a, just hold on for a moment. The name is August, A U G A U G. Yeah, that last date of August. No, no, the living dates of August Layard. Yeah, the surname is L A Y A R D. I am awful at spelling. Do not hold that against me. We do not spell that much in primary school in Spain because we speak and write the same. I mean, we pronounce and write the same thing. The thing we see, the thing we pronounce. Like, there's no comp there's, there's no complications to it. So, yeah. I was gonna say, this is Gula or Nin Karak, and she is actually one of the most cool goddesses. That is awful English. That is the coolest, one of the coolest goddesses ever. She's a goddess of medicine, of health and healing, and of physicians or doctors. She is the great healer, and that who makes the, the greens sprout, which is fantastic. And by, by these herbs she makes sprout, we understand that they are uh, medicinal herbs. And uh, she also has a little power sort of regeneration because she is thought, she was thought to have the same influence on top of, of uh, bones and muscles. That is how powerful Ninkarag uh, is because yeah, this power she held over over crops and over greens to make them grow strong, she was thought to have over bones and muscles. So she is the goddess of recovery. You know, when you when you hurt yourself pretty badly, she's the one you want to go to. And uh, she has certain, as a goddess, she has certain connotations of fertility. But, but she had like a twist. She had like a, you know, one of her lights was not entirely up like on upstairs she had this dark like this dark turn of herself she could provoke thunderstorms and earthquakes if she was pissed and um we don't know if she was in fact the goddess of, of, of dogs but dogs are her companions normally like to a 90 percent of chance is that if you see a goddess with a dog it must be ninkarak because yeah, dogs are her loyal companions, and also she has three, uh, three kids, three uh, three kid deities, and one of them we're going to talk about right now, which is Danu. I don't have an image for Danu, I'm afraid, but he is one of the sons of Ninkarag, the oldest son of Ninkarag, and he is a god of vegetation and plants, medicine and rebirth. It said like the wet nurse of this god. Um, by the way, Damo was young. He was deemed as a very, very young kid. In fact, uh, some translations point out that his name means the kid, like the child. And uh, it was said that the wet nurse of this baby and uh, his nanny was a cedar. Which is, just, I, I love that. I really want that too. It's really because I love it. And uh, at the same time, he was a physician and an exorcist. And apparently he was uh, very popular among women because there's groups of women that revered him and pay homage to him together. And we know about that. And uh, he was specially linked with these new crops, these new greens that appear after, um, you know, after winter these regeneration crops that appear uh, in spring. Like this is these tiny like saplings that uh, uh, sprout from the earth after the winter. What is that? I don't know. They were dogs like little cute. Okay, were they dogs? Oh, it's a question, okay. Were they dogs like cute little boys or more of the bewebbed dog kind? If we're talking about Ninkarak, I would be inclined to think the latter. 
that yeah they would be like beware of the mastiff because those kind of gods uh, gods <laughs> the dyslexia uh those kind of dogs that appeared in in uh, Assyrian relief especially and in these kind of portrayals they are um, uh, a mastiff breed and they were huge massive and dangerous those were the dogs used to hunt lions the puppy right like just come here sit on my lap kind of puppy. hell no like they they were big massive dogs yeah all right, the time has come for you to know one of the most popular deities ever created and one that I dislike a lot. But since he is super popular, we need to deal with him. Here we have number 29, Ninurta. Mm -hmm. mm, I'm not particularly fond of him, but he's, he's cool. I mean, he's cool. I'm not personally fond of him, but he's cool. Ninurta is a god of agriculture and uh, of ship, uh, shipmanship and you know yeah of, of cattle and he's also a god of hunting of plow and earth as in the soil of it and he's strongly related to scribes and the law. Ninurta is the protagonist of many many different stories the like epic stories like the tables of destiny for example which is so cool and Ninurta had a hammer a, a flying hammer a flying talking hammer whose name was Sharur and in the most ancient text he was uh, Ninurta was the deity in charge of expelling demons to protect humans therefore he was also connected with medicine Ninurta was an exceptional warrior definitely those you know that those that will slap your face without blinking three times and the, the, the kind of warrior that will kill you in seven different more very creative ways before your head has touched the ground this is how Ninurta acts he's like it's fierce and courageous and and a jackass too because apparently all these deities are jackasses themselves and so you could imagine the Assyrians really liked uh, Ninurta because he was a little bit of a savage. Although, let me tell you, back in the day, in antiquity, everyone was a savage. <laughs> I, these, these kind of thought of just the Assyrians being savages, we need to take, we need to get rid of that. Everyone was a savage. Let me tell you, every single one, the Sumerians, the, the Hurrians, the Chaldeans, everyone was a savage. But... Ninurta was especially revered in, in the Syrian societies because, well, obvious reasons. He had temples in Nippur and in Kalhu. And in his iconography, he's normally portrayed as wielding weapons or hunting instruments, especially the bow and the arrows. And a lot of times he's given these four uh, wings in the back, like this. I'm going to talk about this in a minute. And... Um, he he's uh, accompanied we identify Ninurta uh, when he's accompanied by a monster that actually is half of a scorpion uh, the scorpion is a very powerful um, animal in Mesopotamian mythology and depending on the myth as I was saying Ninurta is the kind of deity that shoots first and then he asks right we this is one oh, oh they gave me right good good thing that you gave me the date of layard so he lived um yeah 19th century from march 1817 to july 1894 so august layard was in nineveh and one of the very earliest um uh, archaeological missions and he drew a lot of things he saw in a lot of temples and you're gonna see if you google Ninurta I swear I mean I bet my hands and I won't lose them that you will see this fella over here we have no idea who this one is no idea this is one of the things I tell you about being very cautious with the iconography we use to address war exactly he is not Ninurta we have no idea who he is and look by looking at him he's these kind of weapons are considered to be thunders so he could be Ishkur these these gods could be Ishkur could be Ninurta could be Marduk himself we don't know because because there was no text attached to it a lot of representations and a lot of interpretation have been given um, about this particular relief but bear in mind we don't know for a fact this is not Ninurta 
He is as valid as Ninurta, as he's valid to any other deity your heart could wish for. Because this is not Ninurta. We don't know. I know I'm a little bit intense for this. I know I'm a little bit like uh, but empathetic, but I really want Bacha for you to reflect upon some of the things we see in the internet. We cannot believe everything we see, and I know you're intelligent enough to know that, but, but, in the case of Mesopotamian iconography, bear in mind now that when you find this image, or if you see that on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, and someone is courageous enough to say, that they know for a fact this is an urta del lion because we don't have a reference or an evidence of text or anything that could point towards this creature being an urta. He's a god. He's a smitting god. Eh? Eh? Do you see the smitting thing? Eh? 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 <laughs> He's a smitting god, for sure. But an urta? Maybe. Maybe he is an urta. Maybe he's not an urta. We don't know. And you know what, Bacha? We don't know, and that's okay. I feel one of the things we struggle most, not me personally, but you know, historians and our historians struggle the most with admitting those things we will never be sure of. We will never know unless we have a Ouija board and resurrect somebody from the period. And then they will have to deal with all the communication barriers and language things. But you know what, again, you get me. Um, unless we do that, there's things we will never know. And that is okay. That is entirely okay. I don't have a problem with that. Do you have a problem with that? I don't have a problem with that. Okay, and number 30, and the last deity we're going to talk about today is Namma. Namma, she was the patron of Eridu and the mom of the biggest jackass in the entire Mesopotamian pantheon. Where is David? Is David here? David, are you here with me? Namma is the mom of Enki. So you can imagine how the mom was. Like Anne the father, the great father, all the deities, uh, Namma belonged to a extremely ancient lineage of gods and goddesses. She's the mom of the cosmos and the creator of everything. Namma, I mean, if, if An is the father, Namma is the super grandmother of everything. She is the one that actually taught magic to his son, to Enki, and she is Bear in mind, but this is super cool. This is super cool. She is the only goddess, female deity, that is a creator goddess, and she doesn't need a male companion to create the universe, to, to just give birth to the universe, which is very curious and very rare and fantastic. In fact, in fact, it's supposed to be her idea to create humanity. And then, and then, she, she gave that suggestion to her son, Enki, and he was the one who carried on with it. But the idea, the original thought, was Namma's. How cool is that? How cool is Namma? Although she must be a little bit, you know, like, touched in the head because she... First of all, she gave birth to Enki. Why? <laughs> and second of all, she has, you know... She's the mother of sorcery. And her, her, you know, the, the, the ladders and windows upstairs where, you know, <laughs> men are under, no, it's Namma, it's N-A-M-M-A, not Nammu, I think that was another deity. Why is that Kiwi? Well, people on the internet never speak without thinking, they always fact check, right? Sometimes I forget that I am dealing with the internet of things. So yeah, that, uh, that, that was Namma, one of the coolest deities in the Mesopotamian pantheon, if you ask me. And, but ciao, that's it for it. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Monday stream. I hope that I just made you acquaintance with some deities that are not exactly known, but would you agree with me? They're exactly the same. Cool. I really like all deities I show you, especially I would say my heart goes with Pathuzu, but he's very well known. So if I need to pick up one of the 15 I show you today, I will pick up Gira. I really like Gira as a fire god. I think he's fantastic. And second place, I will pick, I will pick Namma because it's like, I just imagine her to be this edgy, cranky grandma, kind of like swinging in the rock chair of the Porsche of the Cosmos. They're like, ain't nobody got time for human shit. Like, <laughs> go Enki, you deal with it. Oh my God, how crazy you have to be to be the mom of Enki. Like, it's just, 
well, because Enki's a jackass, but we love him dearly. Thank you so much for tuning in with me. I hope you enjoyed the ride. And by any chance, if this is the first time you come across this, um, this Twitch channel, hello, this is La Pluma de Simur, and I am Plumas, your host. And here we talk about medicine, mythology, literature, to science, history, art history of Mesopotamia and Iran. Thank you so much to all the people who's click on follow. Thank you so much for all the people that have subscribed. Thank you to my patrons, my amazing patron team. And uh, yeah, as always, thank you for tuning in with me. If you want to catch a glimpse of what this project is, you can follow me in all the social medias of the project. If you look at, at Las Plumas de Simur, you can find me on Instagram, on Twitter, and all that jazz. It's been great to control the, the next one. Thank you so much, dearies. Thank you, I go. <laughs> I really had a great time with you. You will be surprised. I've talked to some parents. Ooh, oh my God. <laughs> the drill. <laughs> so, to some parents for what? For tuning in here? I'm a very family friendly channel. Yeah, bring your sons, bring your daughters, bring the offspring of your house. <laughs> So thank you so much, Bucha, for joining in uh, with me. I'm going to grab my mug over there. And yeah, if you also speak Spanish, by any chance, I remember that on, on Monday we stream on English, but on Thursday we do stream on Spanish. So yeah, will I see you there? I hope I will see you there. Bucha, I hope you have a very lovely week and a very lovely night evening i don't know whatever you want and hopefully i will see you guys next time and you know until we see each other again create explore and have fun see you soon ciao bye